Okay, thanks, Ms. Beth, and good evening and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, as Beth said, my name is Mark Gill. I am a civilian employee with the United States Coast Guard. Um, I uh, manage the vessel traffic service in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, our primary focus for that mission is uh, the uh, management of commercial shipping on the St. Mary's River, 77 miles service area. Uh, if you kind of uh, focus or, or imagine uh, air traffic control around a runway, the Sioux Locks would be our runway and our office uh, manages uh, the approach to the runway. So as vessels enter and leave the St. Mary's River, uh, we keep bad things from happening to them uh, as they queue up to, uh, to enter or depart the, the Sioux Locks. Uh, my background uh, is, is kind of diverse. I spent 21 years active duty working for the Coast Guard, various shipboard assignments, uh, the last of which was an icebreaker in, uh, that's stationed out of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, my love for the lakes uh, kind of uh, led me to my follow-on career. Uh, after retiring from active service, uh, failing that retirement, I returned to work as a, a civil servant, and uh, this is my 19th year as a civil employee of the United States Coast Guard. Tonight's presentation is going to focus on Great Lakes icebreaking. Um, we're going to speak to a little bit of the history, how we landed with the mission, um, how we uh, set up and perform the mission, some priorities of service, uh, and then uh, some basic uh, uh, operational uh, understanding, and then uh, a little synopsis of uh, the forecast and, and how we've landed where we've landed this winter. Uh, to warm up, um, we'll uh, kind of sequence through a couple of pictures. Here uh, is the Coast Guard Cutter Mackinac, the new Mackinac. Um, here we have a 140 foot ice breaking tug alongside a thousand foot uh, uh, Great Lakes carrier. In the foreground here is a 225 foot buoy tender. Uh, these buoy tenders uh, replaced 180 foot buoy tenders. Uh, those 180 foot buoy tenders were ice breakers by design. Uh, this platform, not an ice breaker, it does have some capability in the ice and we'll speak to that, uh, but designed more to work buoys in ice than it is to actually break ice uh, and to facilitate uh, uh, navigation. And we'll speak to that a little more uh, in the presentation. A lot of our work happens uh, uh, in uh, the after hours. Uh, our mantra is uh, uh, we don't like to work ice at night. It's typically very dangerous. Um, when you're working in close proximity to ships, often within feet of these large commercial ships, our ice breaking platforms need to be able to see. Uh, during nighttime hours, it's also very cold. Uh, exposing ice to cold, cold air creates a vapor, which makes visibility difficult. Often in the evenings is when our weather patterns, our storms come through. And so blowing snow, uh, blowing snow off of the ice, uh, this vapor we call sea smoke, uh, can challenge the ability to not only see the vessel we're trying to assist, uh, but also try and see the ice that we're trying to assist vessels through. And so very often we try and shy away from nighttime work. But as you can see, we often do end up working at night. Our mandate for ice breaking comes from an executive order. I know executive orders aren't very popular these days, uh, but this one has stood the test of time. 1936, Franklin Delano Roosevelt charged the newly formed Coast Guard. Um, and our history is uh, a bit diverse, um, but uh, coming together as an entity known as the Coast Guard in 1915. So about 20 years into our existence, uh, he charged us to uh, assume uh, control of a couple of Navy tugs uh, that were positioned on the Great Lakes. Uh, and we wanted to break ice for three main reasons. Uh, that executive order, executive order charged us uh, to protect the environment, safeguard icebound island communities, and then to meet the reasonable demands of commerce. And it's that reasonable demands of commerce that's going to kind of be a theme throughout the presentation as we try and decide what is reasonable and what is not. What would a mariner think is reasonable and what would the government uh, in trying to facilitate the mariner's desire uh, think is reasonable. Organizationally, we've split the Great Lakes in half. Uh, the eastern half of the Great Lakes is managed out of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, the western half is managed out of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Uh, with the Canadian Coast Guard uh, running their operations for Great Lakes out of Montreal. Some may know that the Canadian Coast Guard also manages the Arctic icebreaking mission. 
it's a year round evolution for them. So the Arctic in the summertime uh, is uh, open with warmer temperatures to facilitate navigation up there. And so they're busy in the summer months uh, working ice in the Arctic. And in the winter when the Arctic becomes cold and counterproductive to movement, uh, they shift their focus down here to the Great Lakes and they run uh, operations here with us in partnership for the Great Lakes. A 1980s treaty lays the groundwork for us to work with uh, the Canadian Coast Guard. We co-manage here in the Great Lakes. Um, if you look at the blue stars, that indicates the home ports of our various icebreaking assets. The red stars indicate the Canadian assets. And we'll go through them each one by one here in a couple of slides. Um, but what I would like to focus on is that treaty uh, gives us some function in the Arctic where we lack resources and the Canadian Coast Guard has more. Uh, we get some strategic benefit out of support they provide us in the Arctic. And in a, in a turn of events here in the Great Lakes, we provide them some strategic advantage by partnering with them here. Uh, the two names, Operation Taconite and Operation Coal Shovel, come from the principal cargoes that moved from these back in the 1970s. A year-round navigation experiment was conducted with the U.S. and the Canadian shipping industries. We learned several lessons during that time frame. Uh, that experiment showed us that uh, the Sioux locks, uh, kind of long in the tooth, was not uh, functionally capable during the most extreme uh, portions of the winter. Great Lakes shipping themselves, the ships, um, suffered uh, great damage both in hull fracture and in engine uh, problems due to the extreme cold in the, in the dynamics of the ice during the winter months. And so it was decided at the end of that, uh, that experiment in the latter part of the 70s uh, that we would set up a 300-day navigation season starting in um, mid to late March uh, and ending in mid to late January. And then in the middle there, that 60-day uh, window would be uh, where the Sioux Locks could uh, conduct maintenance uh, to restore itself to health and the shipping industry would also do some layups where they could also attend to their maintenance issues. It's not just the Sioux Locks that we're talking about. We also work with the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, they have the seven locks that connect Lake Ontario to the Atlantic Ocean. This is the byway that uh, allows the foreign flagships to enter into the Great Lakes to trade during the summer months. This also includes the eight locks that are at uh, the Welland Canal which connects Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. Uh, those 15 locks co-managed by the United States and Canada uh, see to the entryway for foreign flagships and many of uh, the Great Lakes traders that winter in Lake Ontario. Taconite being a form of iron ore, coal formerly traded in the 70s and 80s, less so this, uh, this uh, 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 time of, uh, of operations but still the name stuck and, and so coal shovel for the East and taconite for the West. Uh, mentioning the seasonality of the Great Lakes. Um, so ice typically begins to form on the Great Lakes, specifically out West Lake Superior, um, usually mid-December and usually by Christmas uh, first of the year, we're in full blown ice breaking mode. So this extended navigation season uh, begins generally when ice forms and starts to hinder navigation in that middle to late December period and extends up to lock closure. Uh, the spring navigation season starts a couple of weeks ahead of the opening of the Sioux locks. Uh, we could also call that spring breakout. That seven to eight week period in the middle uh, is known as the winter navigation season. Uh, spring navigation is also tied to the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway. They're not fixed with their timing whereas the Sioux locks by law close on the 15th of January and open on the 25th of March, the Seaway has some flexibility in this opening and allows conditions to dictate when. So typically they close around uh, the 20th of December, give or take five or six days either side of that. Uh, and then in the spring, similarly around the 20th of March. Now famously this year, uh, the demand for iron ore has dictated that perhaps we may see an early opening to the Sioux locks and while the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, examines that, uh, that request to open early, compares that to their need to complete winter maintenance, contracted winter maintenance, um, we may see that opening uh, uh, come about a couple of days early. So our tools in, in the toolbox on the U.S. side, 
Uh, the backbone of our fleet is the 140 foot ice breaking tug. Uh, we have six of these on the Great Lakes, specifically designed for the Great Lakes. Uh, if you look at the bow or the forward end of the ship, kind of a football shape that allows it to ride up on the ice and use the weight of the ship to press down and break ice. Um, unique to this platform is a system we call the bubbler system. Uh, there is a series of holes around the middle of the hull um, and compressed air is forced through those holes and it creates a curtain or a, a shield of bubbles around the hull of the vessel and it keeps ice from sticking to it. This gives this great maneuverability, specifically in the riverine environments where we see large accumulations of ice uh, break apart, refreeze, and then thicken into a form of ice we call brash. And that brash is very sticky and can cause movement uh, problems. Uh, so this bubbler system unique to this platform is a great, uh, great tool. This ship uh, and its uh, sister vessels just recently went through a service life extension program where each of these platforms were taken to Baltimore uh, to the Coast Guard Yard, uh, where we did some hull uh, improvements, uh, cropped out old hull plating, replaced that, made some habitability improvements, some electronic equipment improvements, uh, and then also some minor engineering improvements. Two of the six of these vessels, the one stationed in Detroit and the one stationed in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, also work with a barge. Um, the barge is equipped with a crane similar to what is on our buoy tenders, uh, and it allows it to work aids to navigation. Uh, that barge uh, and tug combination allows us to work aids to navigation or buoys in sheltered waters, unstable out in the open waters of the Great Lakes. So we have to be very careful about how we deploy that. Speaking of that buoy tender, the 225 foot sea going buoy tender, we have two of these on the Great Lakes, one stationed in Duluth, that's the Alder, and the other is stationed in Port Huron, um, and that's the Hollyhock. These two vessels uh, um, offer a great tool in the ice. We just have to be careful about how we deploy them. Uh, great amount of horsepower provides uh, a good ice breaking capability, but they lack the hull strength uh, in thicker portions. And so we, we don't typically like to deploy them in ice greater than two feet in thickness. They offer a nice square stern and a wide beam of 50 feet. So it sets a nice track for vessels to follow. But they have a very uh, weak rudder system. They don't back well in ice. And so this platform we usually try and put in straight line work, uh, usually setting up or maintaining tracks. And we like to have open water areas where they can turn around so they don't have to try and back and fill in ice, uh, which pre puts pressure on that rudder system. This platform um, getting into its 16th season is setting up to go through a similar process that its 140 foot ice breaking tug cousin went through, a service, excuse me, life extension, um, which will be taking place in Baltimore. These platforms first alder next summer and then the Hollyhock the summer after that will leave and different platforms, different named vessels will come back to the lakes in their place. The idea there is to take these freshwater boats and put them out into the saltwater and then try and extend the light of some of the saltwater platforms into the Great Lakes here where the fresh water is a little easier on the hull. Um, the big, uh, big mover in the Great Lakes is uh, the Coast Guard Cutter Mackinac, the Great Lakes icebreaker. Uh, commissioned in 2007, uh, this platform also getting a little long in the tooth, hard to believe that she's already 14 years old. Um, but specifically designed for Great Lakes. We went around the world studying different types of platforms and landed on this particular vessel for its multi-mission capability. The old Mackinac was brute force strength, kind of a sledgehammer in the ice, pounded away with strong horsepower. This vessel, a little bit more of a precision tool, kind of like a surgical knife. She cuts through the ice, highly maneuverable, uh, but also offers us multi-mission capacity. She has a crane, so she works buoys. Uh, she also has an installed uh, vacuum system uh, for our environmental protection mission um, that allows her to, with uh, some recovery equipment, uh, pull up pollutants that enter into the water. Some of you may remember a couple of years ago uh, that a, a, a laker crossing uh, the Straits of Mackinac inadvertently uh, let their anchor go and dragged it across 
a series of cables that were underneath the Mackinac Bridge, just east of the Line 5 pipeline. And hooking those cables, uh, there was a, an unknown solvent inside those cables that leaked. We believed it initially to be caustic to the environment. And so Mackinac and one of the buoy tenders uh, were on scene using those skimming systems to recover that material. Uh, we did later find out that that material was not dangerous to the environment. Uh, we did recover most of it, but just the same, it did prove that the system is very functional. You see mentioned this Azipod. So old Mackinac featured in the two pictures on the left, the new Mackinac featured on the right. If I focus your attention to the bottom right section, you'll see the pair of what we call Azipods. Uh, for fishermen in the audience, these are kind of like trolling motors where you point the propeller in the direction of where you want the vessel to go. They actually pull the vessel through the ice. Very efficient, very powerful, and very environmental friendly. Uh, there's virtually no fluid inside the pod to leak. It's all self-contained inside the vessel itself. These pods are very expensive to work on, a million dollars just to take it out of the ship uh, before you even turn a wrench to do any work on it. Uh, this design came from the Scandinavian fleets that worked the Arctic, um, and it is very positive and, and, and effective in Great Lakes ice. As I mentioned, the precision, the old Mackinac, uh, again, very powerful going forward and backwards, uh, but not very maneuverable. It took several ship lengths to turn her around. The new Mackinac is able to turn around within her own length. So within 250 feet, she's able to spin around and, and return to the area that she's working. So that makes that very efficient, especially in close quarters situations or in the riverine environments that she often works. So collectively together, the uh, top left, bottom left and top right are the US fleet. Uh, the bottom right picture is uh, the Samuel Risley. It's a Canadian Coast Guard ship that's assigned here to the Great Lakes. Uh, her partner is the Griffin. Uh, very rarely do we see the Griffin in the Western Lakes, mostly patrols the Eastern uh, end of Lake Ontario occasionally works uh, Lake Erie and the St. Clair River. Uh, she did make a run up to Thunder Bay last spring. So if uh, boat nerds were looking around, we did see the Griffin at one time. But in my 19 years here in the lakes, uh, uh, this uh, first time I've seen Griffin uh, up in this direction. So our buoy tender down in the bottom left corner, Mackinac upper left, and the 140 foot ice breaking tug in the upper right. Mackinac good for about four feet of ice. Uh, the 140 foot tug is good for three feet of ice. And as we said, the 225 is good for about two feet of ice. So we have a, a partnership with Canada. I mentioned that treaty that allows us to interchange uh, resources. Uh, Coast Guard Cutter Alder, which is a buoy tender station in Duluth, uh, Duluth, uh, Minnesota, uh, four winters ago, or excuse me, four summers ago, she spent a summer up in the Arctic on an exchange mission. Uh, these pictured here, the Pierre Radisson upper left, the de Grosier upper right, and the Martha L. Black in the bottom center. Uh, these are medium class Arctic icebreakers. And when the ice uh, gets a little bit more than we can handle here with our uh, Great Lakes resources, uh, we will make requests to the Canadian government and then they will deploy these assets to the Great Lakes, usually in the spring. These three vessels winter in the Montreal area uh, usually have some form of dry docking or winter maintenance going on. Uh, and with the seaway closed during the winter months, usually in the spring, if we have a heavy ice, 2014, for instance, 2015, we had more ice those years than uh, our resources could manage. Uh, we saw all three of these icebreakers come into the Great Lakes. Two, year, two years ago in 2018, the Pierre Radisson came back, and that's the last time any of these were here in the Western Lakes. Aircraft. So you live close to Traverse City, our air station there. Uh, we fly an H-60 helicopter. It's uh, similar to the Department of Defense's uh, uh, H-60 aircraft there. Um, you have the uh, Seahawk that works for the Navy. Uh, we call ours the Jayhawk. Similar airframes, similar engines. They have a de-icing capability. Uh, which is a great step up from what our previous H-65, the Dolphin helicopters, um, you could hear those uh, H-65s, they had a real high-pitched whistling tone to them. 
Uh, the H60s uh, have a much uh, meatier sound to them. Years and years ago, we used to use our aircraft more for reconnaissance. Um, but here lately, uh, we, we do it for spotting of recreational ice use, a lot of area of familiarization, uh, and occasionally uh, we'll do hoist operations, personnel transfers, and things of that nature. We also have an auxiliary fleet. Uh, these are civilian um, uh, volunteers to the Coast Guard, uh, tremendous boon to the Coast Guard force. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the Coast Guard, there are more police officers in the New York City police force than there are Coast Guard women and men in, on, in active service. So we rely on these volunteers, the auxiliarists, who operate their own boats in exchange for fuel and fly their own aircraft in exchange for fuel uh, to support our missions. So that fixed wing support also gives us a hand in this mission. But I mentioned before that we don't rely on these uh, too much anymore for surveillance or for over the horizon uh, 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 ice tracking. And the reason for that is um, we, we've become reliant on uh, satellite imagery. Uh, this image was uh, from a, a week or so ago. Um, it, it really spells the picture of this winter, which is a lack of ice. We've been fairly mild up here. Um, but the quality of satellite imagery and the ready availability used to be weeks apart. We'd get a pass and, and we'd get an image. Um, a lot of times that image would be obstructed by cloud cover. Uh, these new satellites uh, have uh, a radar technology built into them. Uh, we call them radar satellites or radar sat for short. There's a burst of energy that comes alongside with the camera that allows them to see through, uh, through cloud cover. Uh, gives us a very clear image. Um, we have ice analysts on staff uh, with the uh, National Ice Center, which is the United States uh, form. Uh, and then you have the Canadian Ice Service. Um, those two combine to form the North American Ice S Service. Um, and those two entities uh, provide analysis. Uh, you see here some lines driven and some indication of what's going on. Uh, we use these images for route planning. Um, very often we'll steer ships away from dangerous ice um, or in conditions where we can't steer them around, uh, we'll may cut a track and then uh, we'll plant what we call uh, Easter eggs or breadcrumbs uh, through AIS technology and Latin longs and we'll give vessels uh, course and speeds to steer to help uh, drive them through areas uh, where the track may be obscured by snow or things of that nature. So we're gonna talk about why we break ice. You remember that mandate uh, back from the executive order said to protect the environment, safeguard island communities and meet the reasonable demands of commerce. Well, from that we have derived four priorities of service. The first priority of service is really the basis behind the Coast Guard's uh, overall mission, and that's search and rescue. Now, in these pictures here, you'll see various instances of uh, activity. Upper left-hand corner, that's the snowmobile that broke through the ice. Uh, in the far ground, that black uh, dot up there is actually the helmet. The orange ball centered over is part of a heaving line that was thrown to rescue the individual that went down through the ice. Uh, did survive, very lucky. Um, very often what happens, especially in years like this where the ice is weak, uh, folks venture up from places uh, all, over the, all over the nation to come here and recreate on the ice and very often find themselves in trouble. Um, and so these conditions uh, warrant a response. We're not necessarily going to race an icebreaker into a situation like that. We have uh, in the bottom left-hand picture, you'll see what we call an ice rescue team. They have an inflatable craft, uh, a backboard. Uh, they're outfitted with dry weather suits. Uh, when they get wet, they stay dry inside. Uh, they have cleats, picks in their hands, uh, and various uh, equipment to help keep them safe as they venture out onto the ice. The ice rescue team's uh, range of support is about a half mile. So if someone were to venture out several miles out onto the ice to get into trouble, um, we could maybe put the ice rescue team on board one of our icebreakers and sail them in close proximity so that they could shorten the uh, distance to go and perform a rescue. Bottom right hand corner, uh, an unfortunate accident. Folks take all manner of craft out onto the ice. Um, 
Anyone that uh, is uh, in the insurance industry may know that uh, as soon as you take your vehicle out onto the ice over water, uh, your insurance policy is voided. And so in this instance, uh, out of pocket expense to recover that vehicle. Uh, this can be a problem for the environment as those vehicles are filled with oil and gasoline. And, and so we try very hard not to have these things happen. Public advisories, public notices, uh, we do a great deal of public uh, affairs work to try and keep folks from uh, abnormally taking risk, uh, especially with uh, situations when ice is weak. Upper right hand corner, it's interesting. Uh, this is an ice bridge. If you look in the far ground there, there's a series of Christmas trees that mark the path. This is in Madeline Island up uh, in uh, Bayfield, uh, Bayfield, Wisconsin, uh, up in the Apostle Islands. And there's an ice bridge that forms that connects Ashland to Madeline Island. Uh, it's actually an ice road. There's a, a, a ferry that runs back and forth uh, on the surface of the ice. Uh, and folks actually take their vehicles out onto the ice. Uh, this is a shot taken in the spring. Um, you'll see a, uh, an airboat in the far ground next to the icebreaker or the buoy tender. Uh, we'll be asked to come in in the spring and break uh, the ice bridge up so that uh, it'll melt faster. All of these instances, maintaining ice bridges, search and rescue, uh, facilitating the ice rescue teams is part of our search and rescue mission. Our next mission or our next uh, priority of service is what we call urgent vessel assistance. Vessels get stopped in the ice all the time. It's just a matter of doing business during the winter months. But occasionally they'll get stopped in ice where the conditions are so severe, either by wind or by the ice compressing or worse, the ice moving, where that vessel is in danger of either going aground, which means bottoming out on a shallow piece of land, uh, hitting a bridge or hitting another vessel. And so in these circumstances, very often happen at the worst times of day, uh, we'll get the call to go out and either stabilize the situation, top, stop a vessel from moving, or free them so that they don't get into harm's way. So environmental response, or what we call exigent community service, exigent being a fancy word for emergencies, and you remember that help icebound communities, we bundled that into this priority of service which is included in what is called flood control. Now, some of you may know that the United States Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for managing inland flooding for the United States. But very often what happens is emergency managers in various cities and towns will call the Coast Guard for help in these matters, knowing that we maintain a fleet of icebreakers. Well, what the worst thing we wanna do is go racing in to try and break up an ice jam because we really don't understand the hydrographic or hydrodynamics of the waterway. And so that's where we go back to the Corps of Engineers. They maintain a laboratory up in Rhode Island. It's their cold water research laboratory. And they have a series of gauges and computers that help them determine what is the best course of action in relieving an ice jam. This picture was taken in the Raisin River, which is by Monroe, Michigan, just south of Detroit. Uh, this waterway had flooded the community of Monroe upstream, uh, and it was determined that the ice jam here, um, and if you're familiar with Monroe, there's a power plant there. Um, this ice jam was also causing the power plant to run at high temperatures, and so it was deemed necessary to go and break the jam, and so here the icebreaker was nosing up to the ice jam to break it free. Community service requests also involve island support. So in the Western Great Lakes, we manage eight island communities. Uh, there's a handful that are also managed in the Eastern Lakes. So all told, uh, 13 island communities, uh, they rely on ferry service during the winter months. And most of these islands have very resilient ferries. Hulls are strengthened for ice use. Uh, their propulsion systems and their horsepower are strengthened so that they can function during the winter months. But in periods of extreme cold and, and, uh, and heavy ice conditions, they will call for help. Many people live on islands and it's very beautiful and the isolation is sought after. Uh, but because you live on an island does not necessarily mean uh, that you're gonna get round the clock care. And so with island life occasionally comes uh, a little bit of inconvenience. And, and I'll say this with, uh, uh, with sensitivity and empathy uh, but if a ferry can't run, um, let's say it misses an hour or two, and we can refer to Beaver Island since it's close in proximity to Harbor Springs, 
You may be familiar with this ferry that runs from Beaver Island to Charlevoix. And they run hourly. Uh, during the winter months, they slow those operations down quite a bit and sometimes even stop. There's an airfield that lets people fly on and off. Uh, some islands don't have that function. And so when their ferry can't run, they can't get propane, they can't get food stores. And so sometimes when an island is uh, isolated, uh, that becomes an urgent need to replenish them. And so we'll bring the icebreakers in to either break up the waterways so the ferry can run and restore operations, or we may ferry supplies or arrange a different way for supplies, maybe by helicopter, until we can get the waterway reopened again. It doesn't happen all that frequently, especially up here in the, in the Western Great Lakes because our ice is pretty well behaved. Uh, but down in the lower lakes, uh, when they get warm and cold spells, uh, they'll have an ice jam develop that'll block a ferry. And then a couple of 10 days later, that ice jam will melt uh, and they'll be back to normal operations. But they do see a lot more of this type of activity there. So that third priority of service again is what we call emergency community support. So our fourth priority of service is what we call facilitate navigation. Now, remember what I said, reasonable demands of commerce. Um, is it reasonable to take a, a thousand horsepower tug, which isn't really a lot, and go uh, try and run the Straits of Mackinac uh, in the middle of February at minus 12 degrees with the ice cover that extends from Mackinac Island uh, all the way to the west end of the Straits? Um, some would consider that to be unreasonable. Some ships sail underpowered. Some ships sail uh, under-engined. Some ships sail with, uh, uh, with uh, hulls that are uh, they're weak in integrity. Uh, for the most part, our shipping industry, both US and Canada, uh, is fairly resilient, but it's an old fleet. Uh, most ships are better than 30 plus years old. Some in our fleet are 60, even 60 and older. And so with that, you have brittle steel, uh, which doesn't do well in ice, and you have aging plants that don't propel the ships uh, too much. So there's a fine line and a balance of, of how we're managing what is reasonable and what is not. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. So why is uh, shipping so important to the Great Lakes? So here's a snapshot provided by the Lake Carriers Association. This represents a collective group of uh, US shippers on the Great Lakes. It's not 100% uh, of the US fleet, nor does it represent the Canadian uh, commercial fleet. But it does give you a sense for the amount of uh, commodities that are moving. And from a dollar figure, I'll tell you that every ton of iron ore um, is worth roughly 40 bucks. I think it trades between 36 and $38 a ton um, uh, right now. And so when you do the math, you'll see that there's a considerable amount of money uh, that's invested here. And it's roughly 3% of the country's GDP. Now, years ago, I used to work the port of Houston, and that's a huge petrochemical port. And when the Houston ship channel was closed for 12 hours, uh, we were getting calls from the commodities market, questioning the opening and the timing uh, so they could set rates and they can make plans through the day. You can go several days, sometimes weeks, up here in the Great Lakes with a stoppage, uh, and you're not going to see the, the price of iron ore go bouncing around. So these aren't high-priced commodities. Um, and, and certainly 3% of GDP, while it's important, is not going to trigger any kind of a recession if we were to stop things for a couple of weeks. But where it does resonate is the commodities moving represent 55% of the collective economies of the eight Great Lakes states and the two provinces of Canada that border the Great Lakes. That's a significant impact. If shipping stops on the Great Lakes, that's gonna make a dent in the economies of, of all those that rely on the Great Lakes. So just to recap, seven out of 10 vessels moving are carrying some form of iron ore. The rest of those cargoes are made up of coal, limestone. In the wintertime, salt is a big mover. You may or may not know underneath Lake Huron and Lake Erie, thousands of miles of tunnels that mine the salt. And it's brought out in a couple of locations, most notably is Godrich, Ontario. If you think of Michigan's lower peninsula as the mitten, about midway up the thumb due east uh, across the lower end of Lake Huron is Godrich, Ontario. That mine 
owned by a US company called Compass Minerals out of Kansas City, Missouri. And they are responsible for moving all of the commercial grade salt uh, that ends up going across the Midwest. Uh, the snowier the winter, the more demand or higher demand for salt. It's moved principally from Godrich to places like Green Bay, Milwaukee, and Chicago. And then it's put on rail cars and trucks and shipped further west. Also during the winter months, fuel products. Uh, the price of fuel or the movement of fuel is, uh, is a hot topic here around the Great Lakes. Um, two refinery centers on the Canadian side, Sarnia, Ontario, which is uh, just north of Detroit, south of Port Huron. And then of course, Chicago is a big refining town. Uh, both of those entities used to be connected with a big series of pipelines. On the US side, some of those pipelines have been suspended, new regulations, environmental rules, or just the age of the pipelines rendered them uh, unserviceable. And so now a lot of the uh, fuel that's moving around the Great Lakes either moves by tank barge or by tank ship. And especially during the winter months, the gasoline up here in the Upper Peninsula, uh, the west end of uh, Wisconsin, and even parts of Minnesota are coming from that tank uh, supply line uh, that goes to Milwaukee uh, and occasionally to Green Bay's terminal. And then it's further shipped to distributors like in Sheboygan um, and Rogers City. Up here in the Great Lakes, if there's a tanker, it's stopped, excuse me, up here in the Upper Peninsula, I meant to say. If the tanker's stuck down there in the Straits of Mackinac, you can literally watch the price up here at the pump tick a couple of cents uh, over a couple of days. Over a period of a week, that's uh, no supply to Sheboygan uh, or no supply to Green Bay. And, and that price can tick up 10, 12, 15 cents over a period of a couple of days. So it does make a difference. And that's the regional impact that I was speaking to. So Great Lakes shipping, why do we do it? It's environmentally friendly, it's safe. Um, and, and here's why, really the capacity. Uh, the railway lines, we do not have the rail infrastructure to support the amount of cargo that needs to move around the Great Lakes. It just doesn't exist. Uh, if you were to approach any of the railheads, uh, they'll tell you that five years and a commitment for 15 in order for them to build the rail lines. Now, I'm not a railroad engineer or a railroad uh, manager. Uh, this is information provided to us through the Corps of Engineers study. Uh, but what we do know is that if we were to have an interruption um, of Great Lakes shipping for any long period of time, 60, 90 days, uh, there is no real substitute. It would have to go uh, to smaller ships or even trucks to move the commodity. And you can see there uh, just one thousand foot ship um, and the equivalent of five, almost four, well, four million 20 ton trucks to make up the difference there. Uh, and that's a big deal. When you start talking about that many trucks on the roadway and how unsafe that is, and then talking about the diesel and all the other uh, pollutants that are coming from those many, uh, those vehicles. All of this math that goes into this was justification for the new Sioux lock. So now uh, construction started on that last year, um, one year into a seven year project uh, to build a redundant lock. Um, and that cost effectiveness was derived from this very thing, which was the economics uh, in place here were required to maintain the economies regionally uh, and the national significance supported the building of that lot. So let's talk about the season and then we move into how we manage things. So an average year is roughly 120 days, 4,000 of hours in the ice, and we're usually moving about 340 million uh, uh, in co commodity price. Now go back to that year round figure, right? We were saying it was gonna be about $3 billion or 3% of GDP. So we're moving about one tenth of that during the winter months. Some will remember 2014. Uh, that's a generational year, as they tell me. Uh, once in every 30 years, we'll get a, a winter like that. 92% uh, of Lake Superior froze. Uh, at one point, 90% of the Great Lakes was covered with ice. Uh, normally, a 20 hour transit from Duluth to the Sioux Locks. Uh, our first trip across the uh, Lake Superior that spring took four days. Uh, so a, a significantly emotional event was 2014. Last year, light ice year, 
roughly 20% ice cover across the Great Lakes. Uh, we did run long. Ice started early and then we kind of warmed up uh, and petered out. So you see that we did far less in the ice than we normally do and far less was moved as a result. We just didn't have the demand. It was a mild winter in the Midwest. So the demand for snow or excuse me, salt was not there either. So iron ore and the importance of, let's talk about uh, just how iron ore goes. Um, maybe 10, 15 years ago, you used to see huge stockpiles, big piles of iron ore all over the Great Lakes. Uh, the runoff was environmentally unfriendly. Um, we changed the tax policy in the United States. And, and so leaving those stockpiles uh, cost industry because they were taxed at, uh, at real rates. So uh, it was expensive to keep it on. And so they changed their, uh, uh, their supply line to become a just-in-time delivery system. So in the far ground, you'll see iron ore. Uh, in the foreground is uh, limestone uh, used in part of that, uh, uh, that melting process. This is a picture that was taken the first week of January a couple of years ago. Uh, the next slide, you'll see that just in the course of the eight uh, weeks that the Sioux locks are closed, the far ground is a flip reverse of the picture. And you can see that they're literally scraping the storage bin to get up all the cargo sweepings in order to keep the refineries moving, or excuse me, the, uh, uh, the blast furnaces moving. Very expensive to shut down. Uh, the, uh, the molten steel inside will harden. You have to physically chisel that out of there. So you shutter the plant, the manpower it takes to go in and build that out. And then the, the whole time and money spent in cleaning that out. And then of course the loss in production while the place is shut down is very cost prohibitive. And so the, the, the industry relies on uh, a huge amount of iron ore going to them right before the lot closure and then a great demand for it in the spring right as the locks open again. Now this year, interesting. So the because of the COVID crisis, many of these facilities were shuttered last spring. Uh, demand was changed. A couple of these plants changed their uh, process and were uh, making metal products to go into various uh, COVID-related industries. Uh, you heard famously about the, the respirators and things like that, but there was a, a lot of change to the production line. Uh, in, a, in late August, uh, they reversed and went back to regular production. Uh, here in the Great Lakes, not just automobiles, uh, but uh, we're talking about appliances. Um, we're talking about uh, cans for food storage, uh, barrels for storage, any number of things made with various metals are being generated from that iron ore production. Um, but again, the demand for ore this year, particularly great at the end of the lock season. There was some discussion about maybe trying to keep the locks open a couple extra days. Uh, the Corps of Engineers had a, a long maintenance list uh, for the Poe lock, which is the larger of the two active locks. And, and they just couldn't afford to delay the contracts to start that work. They are entertaining an early opening. And so instead of maybe the 25th of March when they're scheduled to open, we might see that the locks will open maybe a couple of days early, perhaps as early as 20 March. The demand is that high. So here's a snapshot. Uh, if you were to go on your computers, and some of you may know marinetraffic.com, Boat Nerd has a, a tracking system. There's any number of online tracking. But this just gives you an instance, first week of January, of how many vessels are moving around the Great Lakes. And we're gonna start this discussion about reasonable demands of commerce. And during the winter months, on any given day, there's 60 to 70 vessels on the Great Lakes that could possibly need an icebreaker. Between the US and the Canadian fleet, we have a total of 11 icebreakers. The Samuel Risley and the Griffin may present two, what we call Great Lakes heavies. Mackinac is one heavy, so that's three. We have six 140 foot ice breaking tugs. So six and three gets us to nine. And then the two buoy tenders, which are not ice breakers, but capable vessels, ice capable. So those 11, which means not everybody's gonna get an ice breaker when they actually want one. So how do we determine priority of service or priority of need and what is reasonable and not? So you remember the four priorities of service. We said search and rescue. This PWCS, 
Ports, Waterways, Coastal Security. It's the Coast Guard security mission. Let's say somebody, an evildoer, decides they want to threaten the Mackinac Bridge or threaten the Sioux Locks or threaten the Blue Water Bridge. God forbid that happens. But in these days, uh, crazier things happen. Uh, we're going to stop everything we're doing and we're going to address that security threat. Uh, that may mean establishing what we call a safety or a security zone around an object and patrolling that with vessels. Um, our small boat fleet, not able to sail in ice, so we would rely on the icebreakers to be the enforcement arm should something like that happen. So search and rescue and coastal security, they're in that number one area. Urgent vessel response, you'll remember that. Community service, flood control, that's that category in number three spot. And then that facilitate navigation. 90% of what we do on the Great Lakes is in that facilitate navigation category. Ships wanting to go from point A to point B, trying to determine who gets the icebreaker and who has to wait. We kind of treat this, and I'm going to use an analogy uh, of kind of going into the DMV, um, or maybe I, I'm trying to think maybe a barber shop or a hair salon. I don't know. Uh, I don't do the hair salon very often, and then. These days, uh, I don't go to the barber shop too much anymore uh, due to the lack of hair. But um, you go in and you take a number and you're going to wait for your number to be called. Well, the ice breaking mission is very similar, um, especially if you've got multiple vessels vying for a short uh, amount of resources. And, and so not only priority of service, uh, but also where the vessel is located is going to help us determine priority of need. And so first order, let's, uh, for an example, let's say we have four vessels that want an icebreaker and I only have one icebreaker available. The first run of questions is, are they in need of search and rescue or is there a security threat? Are they urgently in need of assistance? Are they in danger? Um, not generally a commercial, uh, co excuse me, a community issue unless it's a ferry in need of service. Um, so they all would fall, all four in this instance would fall into that facilitate navigation. Well, then we go into where are they located? So we break the Great Lakes up into a category of four classifications or four tiers. Four tiers where the primary waterways that connect the Great Lakes would be in the highest category. And then the piers or the facilities would be the lowest category or tier four. So to get from Lake Huron to Lake Erie, you're going to go through the Detroit St. Clair River system. To get from Lake Huron to Lake Michigan, you're crossing the Straits of Mackinac. To get from Lake Huron to Lake Superior, you're using the St. Mary's River. To get from East Erie to West Erie, you're going to use Pelee Passage. These are all designated Tier 1 waterways. The government will maintain primary responsibility for maintaining these waterways. Think of these as the interstate. And I'm going to use a, an analogy of snow removal. Your driveway, yours to maintain. The state's plow truck is not going to come into your driveway. The county plow truck is not going to come into your driveway. And unless you pay, you're not going to get a private plow truck to come into your driveway. So you're either going to plow it yourself or you're going to hire somebody to come in and do that. That's tier fours on the Great Lakes. Burlington Northern, uh, Superior Midwest Energy, U.S. Oil Terminal, these all private facilities and docks are maintained by the company. And the government, U.S. or Canada, are typically not going to do work unless there's an absolute emergency. Emergency could be a facility fire, could be some type of a spill event, or it could be a vessel is in danger, maybe a wind event that's causing the ice to fracture and a vessel that was tied up or maybe trying to tie up is running into trouble. There may be an instance where we might go in and try and uh, relieve pressure on a particular vessel so that they can get to the pier safely. But unless it's an emergency, that tier four is wholly private and we're going to defer that to the industry. Across the Great Lakes, we have roughly 40 commercial icebreaking providers. Think of this as your, your, your Joe guy out there uh, that's running a plow truck with a, a blade on the front of it. They are out for hire. Uh, they are Coast Guard inspected, um, but we don't get into the business of determining their capability. We just ask for where do you want to work, when do you want to work, and how do you want to work? And how meaning when do you want to get called? 
And so this collection of commercial ice breaking providers is positioned all around the Great Lakes, uh, most of them around large ports like Chicago, uh, Milwaukee, Green Bay, um, Detroit, Toledo, um, even Cleveland. Some of the smaller ones, the tugs will go from Cleveland to Conneaut or Ashtabula and places like that. But these entities uh, represent uh, private hiring firms that can, uh, for a fee, will go out and work for commercial carriers uh, and they can provide support when we can't be there. Tier threes are the federal channels. So think of that as your side street. As you leave your driveway, maybe you have an HOA or a homeowners association, or maybe you and your neighbors get together and you arrange for a plow truck or your city has a plow truck. Um, that side street's gonna get taken care of by that, either privately or, or some form of government support. Tier twos equivalent to like the county road where you're gonna have a little larger platform. Maybe you see some private work out there, but for the most part, uh, the, the road's getting plowed by the, uh, by the county entities. But if there's trouble, maybe a private entity like a tow truck or a plow truck would come out to, to help you in, a, in, a, in an escort or a pull you out of a ditch or something like that. So tier ones, those are the connecting waterways of the Great Lakes. Tier twos, those are the big waters, um, typically bays or the frozen lakes. So when you come out of uh, the St. Clair River into Lake Huron, Sometimes that southern end of Lake Huron will freeze uh, and it will require ice breaking assistance. Not part of the tier one and it's not part of the tier three. So it's got its own classification, the tier two where the government may or may not do work there. Tier one, uh, like the interstate, that's where your big assets are gonna be. So for us, our big plow trucks are Mackinac, Risley and Griffin. And in the smaller lanes, tier two, tier threes, you're probably gonna see the Bay class, occasionally buoy tender. Um, and then those tier fours, that's where you're gonna see most of those commercial entities. Now, for those who like to log on and maybe pay attention, the Coast Guard operates a network of information hubs. Ours is called Homeport. So if you were to search online USCG Homeport, it'll come up, you'll see the screen here. And there's a pull down menu that gets to location. Um, for us here in, in Sault Ste. Marie, you can click this site uh, if you look, you'll see port status, red lights, green lights indicate areas that are closed. Green lights indicate things uh, that uh, may have some special notes, if there's an icebreaker present or if there are commercial icebreaking providers available. Uh, there's also uh, a link to a document and you can follow along both with ice conditions and what the icebreakers are being assigned to. And this is open to the public. You don't need a password. You just log on, um, open the site, uh, click the links and you can follow and you can see all kinds of information. So if you're interested, you have a curiosity about what's going on. Um, uh, if you're in Naples, Florida, for instance, and uh, you want to see what's happening at home, this may be a way to go in. We post pictures, sometimes aerial photography, satellite imagery and things of that nature, but just a means to kind of track what's going on. So how do we gauge the formation of ice? Three components, water temperature, air temperature, and snowfall. First of all, water temperature. So for the Western Great Lakes, Lake Superior is our primary mover. Most of our weather is originated or is driven by what's happening with Lake Superior. 38 degrees seems to be the trigger for ice. Now, I'm not a meteorologist. I'm not a climatologist. Um, and, and so I'm not going to try and get into climate science or to discuss any of those factors. What I will tell you is that in the United States, we've been measuring temperature since 1888. So roughly 130 plus years uh, of temperature data. We've only been measuring ice or collecting ice data since 1972. So the earth being millions of years old, uh, we know very little about temperature. We know even less about ice. And so what we find from year to year is we learn something new every year. And we say, if you've seen one winter, you've seen one winter with regards to the Great Lakes. So this is water temperature as of today. Uh, you can see relatively um, the Lake Michigan, Lake Huron center part of the lake, still relatively cold, not quite close. That 38 degree mark is the trigger when we start to see ice. The darker the blues give it the little cooler of the water. It's also, if you look down at Lake Erie in the west end there, that's a little shallower. So it freezes or cools faster and then it warms faster. 
Lake Ontario very rarely freezes. It's odd. It sits from a from a uh, an elevation standpoint. It sits a little lower than the other four Great Lakes, and so somewhat protected. Uh, the east end gets a lot of lake effect snow, so the northern part of New York, um, you'll see a lot of snowfall, lake effect snowfall, and mostly because Lake Ontario remains unfrozen, and, and so that lake effect machine stays on mostly all winter long over there. Lake Superior is a close up. You can kind of see that uh, we're right now primed for ice. Typically, this is the lake view that you would see around uh, maybe Christmas time frame. And so for those who aren't in the area, we've had a very mild December uh, and, a, and a mild start to January. Next couple of weeks, we're going to see a return, return to uh, what would be near normal temperatures, at least for a couple of weeks, uh, yet to be determined what we're going to see come uh, late February, early March. Uh, there's some guesstimates. Um, but again, uh, in our world, especially in the ice breaking planning world, we typically stay with the seven to 10 day forecast. You get away from that, you start to bring in a lot of variables and, and, and things uh, just aren't manageable. So just an interesting note. So the blue line represents uh, an average of Lake Superior water temps. The red line is 2020. And so you'll see we've been mostly warmer than normal on Lake Superior, which would explain kind of the, the warmer fall. Uh, we actually dipped below September was cooler, October normalized, and then the end of uh, November and December, we kind of uh, went warmer than normal. And Lake Superior did stay warm. We closed the Sioux Locks 15 January this year to no ice. Uh, in my 22 winters on the Great Lakes, 19 in this current capacity, uh, that's only happened uh, two other times. This is uh, Lake Superior January going forward. Uh, you can see where we started warm and we started to cool off. I suspect we'll see this red line flatten out over the next couple of weeks and kind of hover maybe slightly below normal for February uh, and then go back and normalize into March. Um, it's difficult to predict, but the reason I point this out to you is so that uh, you can see later on when we start talking about air temperature and ice, uh, that most of that driven by Lake Superior influences, especially the northern half of Huron and, and Lake Michigan. Freezing degree days. So this is an interesting term, the National Weather Service and NOAA track these. Uh, it's actually a simple formula. It's the mean daily temperature compared to freezing. Uh, I'm gonna spoil my math and, and just give you a quick number. Don't hold me to the calculation, um, but different from an average is mean. Mean takes into account how many or how long a temperature was in play during the day, uh, whereas uh, an average temperature, let's say today's high was 20 and tonight's low is zero, the average temperature today would be 10. But let's say it's 20 degrees for 14 hours today and it was 10 for three hours and five and and so that variance through the day will affect the mean temperature. But if you take the mean temperature and you compare it to freezing, usually that arc starts to uh, go below freezing um, middle of November. Um, and then uh, over the course of December, January, and February, um, we stay sub uh, freezing. And then in late March, uh, usually around the second or third week of March, we start to warm the air temperature to a above freezing, and that's when we start to see thaw. If today's temperature, let's say the mean was 10 degrees, compared to freezing, we have made the equivalent of 22 freezing degree days. If we have a, a, a mean temperature of 10 degrees for the next five days, we've made 22 freezing degree days over the course of that five days, we've made the equivalent of 110 freezing degree days. Now, through our studies, what we've determined is when these numbers accumulate to certain figures, 125, for instance, 250, 325, 400, 500, 700, we can make decisions about vessel movements and waterway behavior. 125 freezing degrees typically is the tipping point when water temperature is at 38, where you're going to see the formation of ice. When that freezing degree day gets to 250, we're going to start to see ice hinder commercial movements. When it gets to 325, 
uh, your bays and your riverine environments are going to see almost a complete coverage of ice. So if you look on this scale, we're measuring for many of the Western Superior ports, Thunder Bay, Ontario, Duluth, Houghton, uh, on down the line. Thunder Bay and Duluth, west of the Keweenaw, uh, average, above average cold the, this fall and into the winter months. They had ice very early uh, and kept it. But the formation kind of misbehaved because our temperature and our winds were variable. And those temperature fluctuations kept the ice from growing. So although we had extreme freezing degree day counts, we really didn't have the extreme ice cover that normally accompanies in that. And so I tell you, freezing degree days are anything to do with these measurements, not exact science. Um, it's uh, an opportunity to give us uh, some measure uh, of, uh, of growth and some measure of uh, behavior on vessels. When we get to 400, 500 freezing degree days, we'll start to look at uh, vessel configurations, uh, tugs pulling toes, uh, barge traffic. They typically start to struggle when ice is uh, covered in waterways and the ice uh, um, starts to impact their ability to push and pull. Uh, so we might limit those or might put extra horsepower requirements where they got to take a tug to help them uh, move. Um, articulated or rigidly connected tug barges, Presque Isle, for instance, if you're familiar with that vessel, or some of the other tug victories. Um, I'm trying to think of top of my head a couple of them that come to mind. Um, there's a, a number of those vessels where they're rigidly connected. There's a pin that connects the tug to the barge. Um, and, and so we start to see them struggle around 500 freezing degree days. And even the most powerful vessels on the Great Lakes struggle when those numbers get up into the 600s, 700s. So again, just an indication on how to gauge the level of ice and its impact. Snowfall. For those here in the area, um, you already know that our snowfall is below uh, seasonal average. The red line is where we should be. The green line is where we are. The blue line represents where we should be uh, at the end of the season. And all across Michigan, we're well below our seasonal totals for snow. Think about this. If you were to take a, a, a cold glass of water put it in the freezer and then take another cold glass of water and put some shaved ice in it. Put them both in the freezer. The water with the shaved ice in it is going to freeze faster because it's already there. Ice and snow, if you think about cold water, the snow acts as a seeding agent. It helps it coagulate, especially on the surface and in uh, areas that are protected from wind. And so the St. Mary's River, for instance, or in the Detroit St. Clair River system, where you've got a fairly protected riverine environment, if you put six, eight, 10 inches of snow on top of uh, say 36, 37 degree water, you're gonna make some form of ice uh, very rapidly to the point where it's gonna start to hinder movement. And, and so uh, with water temperature, with air temperature and with snow, that's the makings of ice. So here's the Great Lakes today. Um, I'm not sure if you can make out the color variances. Uh, the light gray colors are what we call flash freezes. Uh, the ice is less than 10%, but if you were to get up on it and take a look at it, um, you'd start to see some pancake shapes, some disks. Um, you can start to see some crystallization move off the shoreline. Uh, these, these are early stages of ice development. Uh, normally this time of year, we're seeing roughly uh, 15 to 20% of ice cover on the Great Lakes. So we're well below normal for ice cover. In fact, this slide shows you uh, all the red areas this is where we would normally see ice this time of year and where we don't. The darker the red is the greater absence of ice. So if you look in the St. Mary's River, um, you know, we're, we're not quite where we normally are. Uh, but if you look in the Straits of Mackinac, we're nowhere close. I mean, Straits of Mackinac this morning was wide open. Uh, there's no ice anywhere. Green Bay has a little bit of ice, but not anything uh, uh, that it would normally have. And you can see across the Great Lakes how that would be. The green line statistically represents 35 years of, uh, of ice. So if you were to compare that to the week by week ice cover, uh, the green line represents statistical average. Uh, you can see that we are well below what is statistical average. And if you follow the last blue bar straight up to the dot, you'll see that about 15, 16, 17% of ice cover is about what we have this time of year. If you go across the bottom, that's the weekly dates. 
If you go straight up from where you see 0319, that's the third week of March, that's the statistical peak of, of Western Great Lakes ice breaking. And, and so for those that are Punxsutawney Phil fans come the 1st of February, um, and we always uh, you're hoping that uh, he doesn't see a shadow so we can have our early spring. Um, no, no matter how long spring lasts, uh, we're going to keep ice until about the third week of March. Uh, a couple of years we've broken ice um, earlier in December and well later into the season. 2014, we broke ice into Father's Day weekend. Uh, so that was an abnormally uh, long season. The big three, uh, for folks who have been around the lakes for some time, may remember some of these, 1979, uh, certainly 94, uh, and then 2014 I spoke about earlier. Uh, the pictures here come from the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. This information's online if you just search GLURL. Uh, their repository of information, their graphics, uh, it's an amazing site. Uh, I encourage anybody that has an interest uh, to go and kind of pick through the site. Uh, they have a historical uh, uh, section where you can actually go through uh, year by year the various ice covers. Uh, they're animated and pretty interesting to watch to see how the ice forms and, and the different excuse me, different year groups, pictures and, and things and parts of their studies there as well. I mentioned the North American Ice, or excuse me, the National Ice Center, Canadian Ice Service. If you search those acronyms, NIC or CIS, you can also get to those sites and you can see the repository of information, uh, including the current products for this year and uh, recent years. Here's another representation of what's happened through uh, the course of history. Remember I said we started measuring ice in 1972, so that's the first entry that you see on the far left side. And then to the right, you see 2020 in our current season. Um, again, you look ups and downs, it's hard to draw any correlation between what is, um, you know, what is uh, climate driven, what is, uh, uh, what is regional driven, what is just seasonal. Um, I'll tell you that uh, the Pacific influence and how it manages the jet stream I think that carries a lot of weight with the weather guessers, uh, the meteorologists and the scientists involved. Uh, this year is a La Nina year, which means uh, the Pacific uh, has a cooler section to it and that has a, 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 a proclivity to bend the jet stream uh, in a V shape where the V is positioned over the Great Lakes, which means that Arctic air has a tendency to slide to the east and to the west of us. And so if you look at the United States today, East Coast, some of your folks in Florida are seeing some temperatures a little bit below what you normally see. The West Coast is wetter and cooler. Um, California, Oregon, and, and uh, Washington could certainly use the cooler and the, and the moisture uh, because of their drought situation. But what I'm telling you is there are a lot of variables that go into what does each ice year bring. And, and so where you see peaks and valleys here over the course of the uh, of the 40 plus years of uh, measuring ice, it's hard to determine that there's any kind of, uh, of, uh, of pattern or anything developing. Uh, and I'll certainly leave that uh, argument to the scientists as I am not one. Speaking of scientists, here's the climate forecast for this year. This was put out uh, back in uh, the middle part of November. Um, usually these things are good for about 30 days um, and, and so it's holding true well into, uh, into its second month. Um, if you look, uh, the bluer temperatures would indicate cooling trends uh, where it's lighter or close to white uh, would be near normal. And then the darker the red shows you above average temperatures. And this is the anomalies that we're seeing. So December, um, most of the Great Lakes was warmer. Uh, certainly if you look in the middle of Lake Superior, it was a bit cooler or closer to normal. Uh, but the lower lakes certainly were warmer than normal. The forecast for January kind of not going the way they thought because we thought we'd see something closer to near normal, uh, where February is predicted to be uh, warmer than normal and March cooler or closer to normal um, in comparison. So what does this all mean? Um, indicators gives us a, a glance uh, looking ahead and maybe what we can expect. Our friends in the Canadian Ice Service made this slide for me. Um, so to give you an idea of what we're looking at, on the left is last year. That white picture is what actually happened last year. Upper right is their forecast for this year. Bottom right is statistical average. 
Uh, keep in mind that uh, the statistical average here is a 30 year cut. Um, a lot of the different uh, predictors and models that you see, you'll, you'll see 30, 35, 40 years um, uh, in, in, in their statistical models. It really depends. You just got to kind of read the fine print. Um, but if you look last year, we had a below average ice year. This year, very similar. They did expect us to have a little bit more ice than last year. And, and so maybe that cooler January, February, um, if, if that swings in the opposite direction by a degree or two, maybe we, uh, we see um, a little bit more ice. I'll tell you right now, based on what we're seeing and the water temperatures that we have in the lower lakes, um, I, I have a hard time believing that if we don't get cold quick, uh, that we're going to see ice anywhere near that upper right uh, slide prediction. So here's a bar graph. The TAC acronym stands for total area coverage. Um, the Canadians manage this a little bit differently, so their percentages are, are a bit off. So if you look at 77, where it says three tenths of a percentage of ice cover, if you go back to that slide before, those high peak years uh, across the Great Lakes, uh, those percentages are measured differently. Where we measure per percentage of coverage uh, by volume, they measure percentage of coverage uh, by area. So it's a little bit different calculation. The green line represents statistical low average. The red line represents statistical high average. You'll see this year we were supposed to be a little bit closer to what is near normal, uh, but not quite reaching statistical norm. And so what actually happens uh, right now, we're well below what is statistical average. And so we may see ourselves repeating what, what happened last year, maybe even a little less than last year. Okay, um, so that's my slides. Um, I did tell Ms. Beth that uh, I'm willing to entertain questions. Uh, I'm going to drop the PowerPoint here and see if I can uh, get into the chat section here and if I can read that. So. Uh, Beth, while I'm clicking here, if you've got anything you want to throw at me. Yes, we actually had um, the same question asked twice um, by Bob and Christine. Both wanted to know, are there any fees associated with the commercial carriers um, paying for ice breaking or how are your ice breaking services paid for in general? So let's, because uh, I, I introduced a couple of things here. So let me go to the commercial assistance policy first. So the Coast Guard maintains a policy in the search and rescue side of the house, very similar to this. Uh, some of you may be familiar with companies like Boat US or, or CETO. Uh, these, are, um, these are basically private entities that will perform non-emergent or non-emergency search and rescue. Run out of gas or you need a tow uh, or you need a park. Uh, they'll uh, provide all manner of service. You can enter into contracts with them or you can pay as you go with them. The commercial ice breaking policy is very similar. Commercial entities around the Great Lakes uh, usually have a base fee. Some companies have a retainer um, and then companies will enter into agreements. Much the same way you would enter an agreement to have somebody plow your driveway where you get, I don't know what the going rate is anymore, but maybe you get 10 plows for a hundred bucks. Well, in, in the Great Lakes ice breaking industry, the going rate is roughly 90 bucks an hour for a tug. And usually you have a minimum charge of 5,000, so a retainer of 5,000. And it varies based on port and how many other commercial uh, companies are around. Duluth, for instance, has two companies there. So they have some competing pricing and that kind of keeps rate low. Where if you look at uh, uh, the port of Green Bay, there's one entity there um, and, and so, uh, they kind of, they set the margin. There's a couple of companies that have moved into the area, one in Escanaba and one's based out of Sturgeon Bay, and they operate and will compete. And so that kind of fluctuates the price. Um, and so industry pays when they take a tug, just like they would in July. So there's no difference January to July. And the Coast Guard standard is, as long as it's not a search and rescue event, uh, where we can, we'll defer work to commercial providers. Remember, reasonable demands of commerce. The carriers, that's commerce. Your ferry operator is commerce. Your tug operator or your ice breaking operator is commerce. And so we want to meet the reasonable demands of all those components. And just think, if the Coast Guard went racing around the Great Lakes and took all that work away. Commercial tugs, the ferries, uh, they're not going to get any, any, any money out of their, their services. 
And so the government's stealing or taking money away from those entities. And so there's a balance. Now, with regards to the government service, on the U.S. side, uh, there is no fee. Um, so around the Great Lakes, the ports, they charge us a fee for ships that come in and trade there. So there's usually a cargo servicing fee or some type of a port fee that goes along with that. Uh, there's also U.S. taxation. The companies, all the carriers pay some form of taxation. So there's no bill or charge for U.S. ice breaking. On the Canadian side, they uh, charge what is called an ice breaking service fee. It's a nominal fee. It's based on the length of your vessel, um, the cargo capacity of your vessel, and then 10 trips in Canada. Now this was originated in the Arctic um, and it's carried down into the Great Lakes. Um, usually most people, um, US, aren't normally trading in Canada. Um, and normally the Canadians that trade the US, they're prohibited by law from moving from US port to US port directly. So they have to touch a Canadian port in between. So the way the calculation on the ice breaking service fee goes is if you're gonna do business in a Canadian waterway, generally just play the fat, excuse me, the flat rate fee, which works out to be a couple thousand dollars for the company. Uh, and it's usually written into the course of doing or a cost of doing business. So usually the, the, the hiring agent or the entity that's moving the cargo, the facility is pay, probably footing the bill for that. But you never ever see checks cashed or checks made. Just like the Sioux locks, uh, the fees are, are coming from the various port entities and the services that are charged to vessels uh, entering and leaving the port. So that's how that cost is, uh, uh, is brought out. Wonderful. Um, we have uh, another couple questions and actually uh, both Brian and Elizabeth asked the same question. Uh, are there any plans for new icebreakers or Coast Guard um, vessels on the Great Lakes? Any plans to add any? So um, I'll say this, the Coast Guard, uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we operate on a shoestring budget. We're not part of the Department of Defense. Uh, we're actually part of the Homeland Security Department. Um, and we are competing against, uh, 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 I think, 10, maybe 11 entities. I, I've lost count. Uh, but Customs and Border Protection and, uh, and uh, the Immigration Service, all these various entities, TSA, uh, all these factors. And, and so we are in a, uh, a very tight budget climate. Um, the Coast Guard invested a significant amount of its budget on its ocean-going fleet. And so our fleet of icebreakers and buoy tenders uh, are long in the tube. Um, if anybody's been to the Sioux, the Coast Guard Cutter Buckthorn, which is a small buoy tender, they're 65 plus years old. Here in the lakes, our ships steel last much, much longer than those that are out in the salt water. And so we get a lot of life. I mentioned the, the 140 foot ice breaking tugs. Uh, they all went through a service life extension. Uh, they were all 30 plus years old. We hope to get another 20 years out of them. Um, Mackinac, hard to believe, um, but she's already coming in. I think I made a mistake earlier and said 2017. She was commissioned in 27, 2007. So already she's 13 years old. That's hard to believe, but uh, in, in three short years, we'll start looking at her service life extension. Um, the buoy tenders, they're 16 years old. Uh, R2 will go out of the lakes in the course of the next two summers. Uh, they're going to Baltimore to our Coast Guard yards. Uh, Alder will leave uh, Duluth, in fact, this summer. She'll be gone all next winter, and then she'll come back. Um, and she'll be refreshed. And, and again, a hopefully a 20 year extension on her service life. She'll be followed by Hollyhock. Now, Alder goes, another platform will come back. So the boat that's being rehabbed right now, when Alder goes, it'll come out of dry dock and another ship with a different name will come back to the lakes. And the idea there is to take the freshwater boats, put them into saltwater, and then take the saltwater boats into the freshwater and hopefully extend their life. Now, I will say there is, uh, we're always looking over the horizon to try and see what's next. Uh, there's an initiative to look at what's next to the Mackinac. We're also in a design platform trying to look at what's next for the Arctic. 
Um, you may or may not know the Arctic is the is the next greatest uh, strategic line of, of the world. Um, with the warming uh, trend to our climate, uh, the ice there is uh, nowhere near as impassable as it once was. And we're starting to see the Soviets or the Russian fleet uh, spend more time in, in the Arctic. Uh, the China, Chinese fleets have built uh, Arctic icebreakers. Uh, and as far as North America goes, um, and the US Coast Guard, we really only have two capable vessels, I say capable, uh, that can work in that environment. So currently we're planning, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the next generation of Arctic breaker. We're looking at the technology that we employ on Mackinac and we wanna see if we wanna replicate that for the Arctic or do we wanna go with a more traditional design? Uh, we are also looking at uh, a, a seven year project to replace the 140 foot ice breaking tugs. I'll tell you what the Coast Guard likes to do is they like to get bigger and wider if you look at our small boats, um, we've all gotten longer and we've all gotten wider. Um, our icebreakers originally were 110 foot tugs. Now they're 140 foot tugs. Uh, old Mackinac, um, you know, new Mackinac, uh, buoy tenders 180 to 225. Um, yeah, we, we, we seem to want to get bigger and wider. Here in the Great Lakes, wider isn't necessarily better. And, and so what we're looking at is what is the, what is the exact uh, right size so that we can work the river environments plus the open water areas. We also want to look at multi-mission. We want to build buoy tending into uh, our, our next generation of Great Lakes icebreakers. Uh, two of our 140 foot icebreaking tugs during the summer months, they actually notch up and push a, a, an aids to navigation barge. Uh, the barge has a crane that's uh, similar to what is on the buoy tenders. So it has the same heavy lift capacity. Uh, but far less stable. Uh, and so we're looking for a replacement. So like Mackinac, new uh, compared to old went from a sledgehammer to a, a surgical knife. Uh, we look to do the same with our fleet of 140 foot ice breaking tugs, where we look to get a little bit more multi-mission out of them. Maybe not so many, um, but uh, give us a little bit of more dur durability, um, a little bit more staying power. Uh, right now, the 140 fleet is uh, good for about three days of endurance where we got to put them in, refuel them, and take water. Part of that is ballast. We use the fuel in the water to give us some weight so we have a little, we can pack a little better punch. Um, but it'd be nice to be able to go five, six, seven days rather than just three. Hope that answered the question. I think that it did. Um, we've got just a couple more questions. Uh, Mary Jane would like to know what will the effect of the low amount of ice this winter have on water levels in the lakes in the summer? So that's a great question. Lack of ice cover typically means greater evaporation. In the last couple of years, last year removed, um, if you look at 2019, 2018, uh, 2015, 2014, uh, these where we had significant amounts of ice cover and a lot of snow, above average snowfall, the runoff, especially in the upper lakes, uh, and the lack of evaporation um, has resulted in, in water, uh, an increased water level. Up in the upper, um, upper, upper lower river, um, we're carrying four feet of extra water. At, in the middle of summer, that was almost six feet. Now downstream, obviously, uh, and you being downstream from that, you know the effects. Your shoreline is effectively disappearing um, and in some respects already disappeared. Um, we're very concerned, and I say we're, United States uh, Coast Guard, United States Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, Ohio, um, their departments of national resources uh, and their environmental quality departments. We've been studying for the last three winters, the underwater effects uh, specifically to erosion. Um, when there's greater water, ships load deeper. And by loading deeper, their impact or their wake displacement along the shoreline, we believe has an underwater effect. It's hard to measure because you don't see it. Um, so to the specific question, lack of ice cover typically means uh, lack of uh, or more uh, evaporation. 
less snowfall typically means less runout, which means that the upper lakes aren't going to replenish. And so we'll see that water level drop. Um, and, and so we'll have to see. Um, last couple of winters above average or average snowfalls, and then the springs have been wet. With La Nina, we typically see a reversal of that pattern. And, and so maybe we see a decrease in snowfall, certainly a lack of ice cover, and maybe a, a drier spring, which will reduce that one off runoff and we'll see some of the water levels come down. All right, thank you for that. Um, it looks like we just have one more question um, from Andrew. He wants to know what the Coast Guard Auxiliary is. So I, I started to allude to them earlier. So the Coast Guard of Auxiliary is a volunteer organization. You can search it online and you can certainly read and, 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 and they'll, they'll try and sign you up. Um, but basically they're volunteers. They, uh, you don't even have to own a boat. Um, you can volunteer. Uh, we have them stand radio listening watches in our search and rescue command and control centers. Uh, we have them uh, just this winter, one of our cooks, uh, their family had an emergency and, and an auxiliarist who happened to be a restaurant owner volunteered to cook for an icebreaker uh, up in Duluth. So they do all manner of things. Again, voluntary. Uh, they wear a uniform similar to ours. Um, and, and so um, look, it's a volunteer organization. And I, I say this without reservation, we couldn't begin to do our mission uh, without our volunteer uh, partners in the auxiliary. They fly, they sail boats, um, and they service uh, our shore stations uh, to great effect. All right, I don't see any more questions in the chat, so I think we are ready to wrap it up. Mark, thank you so much. Uh, it was great having you here. Thank you to everybody who participated and came to this lecture. Uh, we hope to see you at our next one. Uh, please remember to visit our website at harborspringshistory.org where you can sign up for additional presentations. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Good night.